A little while back before we were confined into our homes and our garages that are just right now, we talked about a few cars that were a little, you know, unsuspecting to the eye, yet able to put down some impressive power. Of course, we're talking about sleeper cars. What's going on everybody? I'm Gels from Fitment Industries and today we are gonna be adding on to that list of cars that we did a little bit while ago with a second part of the best sleeper cars. Before we go ahead and get right into it, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, you know the drill, wheels, tires, and suspension, all available over at fitmentindustries.com. Anyway, something that makes sleeper cars just so freaking cool is the fact that they can just be downright ugly and somehow just still kind of be awesome at the same time. And one car that does that pretty damn well is none other than the Lincoln Mark 8. Introduced in 1993 as a grand touring luxury coupe, the Mark 8 shared some similarities with other cars at the time, such as the Ford Thunderbird and the Mercury Cougar. And these were just some big freaking cars, man, with like total length, like 207 inches from the front to the rear, big and with two doors. In other words, just downright odd. The car came with some pretty nice features like, you know, factory installed computer controlled air suspension with an automatic, you know, height adjustment thing and electronic message center to tell you what's all wrong with your car, automatic climate control and powered leather driver and passenger seats. But most importantly, it packed a 4.6 liter Intec V8 under the hood. The Intec V8 is a four valve dual overhead cam V8 that produced 290 whopping horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque to the rear wheels. The 4.6 was a very popular engine and saw use in plenty of other vehicles such as the Mercury Marauder, the Lincoln Continental, and other variations of that platform were used later on even in the SVT Cobra. And surprisingly enough, the Koenigsegg CC8S, which was a 4.7 liter supercharged variant of the Ford Modular V8 family. A lot of the time, the Mark 8 was labeled as the cheapest Cobra that you can buy. And while yes, they produce only, you know, right around 300 horsepower, it's the capability of the engine that makes it what it is. And that's why, you know, you can consider this a little bit of a sleeper. Attend any local drag racing event and odds are that you may see one or two of these long, ugly faces just show up. Sticking with the same theme for car number two, it seems that American car manufacturers had a time where they just wanted to stick V8s in pretty much anything that they could. And that was especially the case for the Pontiac Grand Prix GXP, which is actually the seventh generation of the Grand Prix, which came out starting in 2003, and then the GXP variant coming about in 2005. However, unlike the last few generations, the seventh generation of the Grand Prix saw something with the GXP that the last few years hadn't had, and that was a V8 sitting under the hood. The GXP came packing a 5.3 liter LS4 V8, producing three 303 horsepower, but not to the rear wheels, it's to the front wheels. The LS4 engine features an aluminum block instead of a cast iron block and was specifically adapted for a transverse placement or a front wheel drive operation. That caused it to end up in some pretty similar cars at the time too, something like the Impala SS, the Monte Carlo SS, and even the Buick LaCrosse Super. And while yes, this is an LS engine and it is capable of doing LS things, LS4 isn't always one of the most sought after engines simply because it was meant for front wheel drive and two upgrading things like the camshaft valve train and intakes you know there're just some extra steps that are needed to you know, like be taken to get the full potential and things getting rid of things like the active fuel management is just one of them a lot of people tend to swap out the intakes as well, changing over to more of an LS6 style intake, but yet again, requiring just a little more than just swapping out that individual part. Overall, it's another LS engine and people love LS engines. And the fact that you can get one in an unsuspecting family sedan, something like the GXP, makes it kind of neat. And if you thought we were gonna get off the V8 train, well, I'm sorry to say, we're not, bud. However, this time we're going to change it up a bit and we're gonna talk about the Jaguar XJR. What started out as the Jaguar XJ in 1997, which was classified as a full-size luxury car sporting a 3.2 liter V8 engine, it wouldn't be long until the XJR variant was born. This time, instead of sporting the 3.2 liter V8, it was fitted with a four liter V8 and just added a little bit of a twist when they added a good old supercharger on it. The XJR version also had some additional goodies with it. Had an upgraded suspension, some even wider wheels, and some larger exhaust cutouts because you know, why the hell not? An R1 performance option was also introduced later into the XJR years, which included some 18 inch BBS wheels, Brembo brakes, and an even more refined suspension. What was classified as a Jaguar 
our AJ26 engine, the 4 liter V8 replaced, was replaced in the year 2000 with the updated version labeled as the AJ27, producing 370 horsepower with help from the Eaton supercharger. And then to wrap up the day, we have what we'll call a little twofer, a little two for Thursday, if you will. You guys remember a little car manufacturer that produced cars that seemed to like, <laughs> like they were like entirely made out of plastic. You know, they always looked incredibly rust free, even up here in Northern Wisconsin, until you actually got under the car, removed the plastic panels, and then just like saw that the frame was about to break in half because it was so rusted. The car manufacturer that pretty much provided an enormous amount of pretty decent first cars for a lot of young drivers, only to meet their demise from high school students or even college student that just, you know, neglected to ever check the oil. Yet, you know, we're talking about Saturn. And we are talking about sleepers, so you know that damn well we are talking about the Saturn Redlines. Now, Saturn actually had two Redline cars. A lot of people know about the first one, the Ion Redline. However, the Saturn View Redline, which I didn't even know existed, doesn't seem to get as much attention. Featuring the same supercharged engine as the first generation Cobalt SS, the LSJ engine, the Saturn Ion Redline was, I guess, meant to target a similar audience. Sure. The Ion Redline features some different body pieces from the original to help out with more of a sportier look or as sporty as you can get in ion to look and some other things to help it out which is the reason why we're talking about this is because when you compare that thing to a cobalt ss the ion is technically more of a sleeper they have that goofy like half door thing going on and the interior is like not much to talk about other than the dashboard i want to talk to somebody about that dashboard if you were like a designer on that car, I just have a lot of questions because like the instrument thing, it just goes all the way over there. But the car offered similar performance to the Cobalt SS and with it being just such a different car in a sense, some people just really were drawn to them. And I have to say the Ion Redline community is a very, very passionate group of people and they absolutely love these cars and they like maintain them super well and like they just, adore these cars on the other hand we have the less talked about saturn view redline instead of ditching the original engine and replacing with a boosted platform they decided to ditch the original engine and then just go to honda for the solution where they decided to go with the 3.5 liter v6 that powers the honda pilot and the honda odyssey and they were available in either a front wheel drive or all-wheel drive configuration the Redline version also sat a little bit lower than the original with some upgraded suspension and then sporting some 18 inch wheels. And while no, they were not fast by any means, probably still not fast, with zero to 60 in about seven seconds flat, it's still a Redline, all right? We're talking about Redlines and we had to throw it in there because it's just kind of goofy and it's kind of weird. And that's that. But that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you guys enjoyed and feel free to comment down below in the comment section what your favorite sleeper car is of all time. Because if we ever decide to do another one of these videos, it just gives us more cars to look at. So I just have to stop bothering Sean because he's just like a plethora of sleeper car information. I just feel like I'm burning him out at this point. But you know what? I love learning more about goofy cars and these are a lot of goofy cars. So I love it. Anyway, don't forget wheel, tire, suspension, fitmentindustries.com. I'm Gels. We'll talk to you later. Peace.